And whether you're Rennie Showers, or me, or Jim, or Mark, or any of you who know the Lord, today we're talking about our ultimate destiny. Our best days are still to come. And we should celebrate that. But there's an awful lot of detail in there that we just simply uh, struggle with, with the details. We, there's some gaps, and we want to fill in the gaps. And we've got to be careful not to speculate, but we want to do our best to work through what we find. So let's, let's get on with it. And this first presentation is on the new creation uh, of the eternal state. And I'm going to show you a couple pictures to launch out. Here's a picture from Revelation Illustrated. It's uh, are the artwork of a person who did uh, several drawings uh, based on the book of Revelation. And this is a picture of what Jim is going to talk about in the next session, the new city, the new Jerusalem. Uh, you see the streets of gold and the trees there for the healing of the nations and the river, uh, crystal clear river, and you see the brightness of that. So the artist is trying to demonstrate what he sees in that awesome picture that's in Revelation 21. And then there's a picture of the, the emeralds of that city and the pearly gate. You see the pearly gates? They came right out of the Bible. The golden streets right out of the Bible. And the pearly gate, I always, when I think about those pearly gates, you know, one pearl makes each gate. And I think that's a big clam. Uh, you just think about that. Uh, it's a, a marvelous city. And, and Jim's going to talk to you about that in the second session. But that's kind of the heart of the eternal state in many ways for us. But there's an awful lot, a lot of other things in here. And I want us to, I'm going to read the first five verses of, the, of Revelation chapter 21. This is my favorite passage in the Bible. Verse 4 is my favorite verse in the Bible. It's usually what I will put down when I sign my name. In fact, the very first sermon I preached in 1977 was on Revelation 21.4. I have a cassette tape of it. I will never let you listen to it. You, you know what? You remember what a cassette tape is, don't you? Yeah. Right. Well, let's read the passage. Follow with me as I read. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write for these words are true and faithful. It really doesn't get any better than that. When you look at the various issues that are in there, there's the issue in verse 1, first issue, the new heaven. Now, the new King James that I read from is singular. Other translations have plural. I'm going to take you to Isaiah, and over there it's translated the new King James plural. And the Hebrew word there can be either plural or singular. It's the nature of it, nature of the language. And so what does it mean when it says, I saw a new heaven? And you have these three choices. In the Bible, there are three heavens. Islam is wrong when it says there are seven. There are three. According to the Bible, the way the word heaven is used, there's the atmosphere of our planet. There is cosmic space out there where the stars and the planets are. And then there's the third heaven, the abode of God, the abode of God. So as you think through, well, which one is it here? I don't think it's the abode of God because the abode of God is brought up in the next verse, kind of a separate thing, this new Jerusalem that comes down uh, from heaven to the new earth. And so that's, I think, a separate issue. So what is he talking about here? I lean toward it being the atmosphere, so he's just really saying, uh, the, the new earth with its atmosphere, the whole planet, just kind of a way of saying it. Now, he might also could imply the cosmic space, 
we're really not sure. But I don't think the focus there is on the abode of God because that comes up in the next verse. But then we have the new earth, not just the new heaven, the new earth. What is that? And the question that's always asked, and is it a renovation? Or is it a brand new plan? Does God annihilate? You know, how does, is it renovation? Or does God annihilate the old planet and create something from scratch that's brand new? And how do we look at that? And I presented two issues up here, and there are good people on all sides. And in the hallways at Friends of Israel, there are people we disagree. And I tell the other people, they can be wrong if they want to be. Um, and I'll have a hamburger or milkshake with you if, if you pay. Okay, that's the way I look at that. We're trying to sort things out. And each side has issues uh, that are a major concern. For the renovation view, that the, the old earth is redeemed renovated, made new. Their concern is the, the passage in Romans 8.22, which talks about where Paul says the whole earth groans, or the whole creation groans, waiting for its redemption. So if that includes the physical things of the, of the planet, then there could be a redemption. In fact, if it's annihilation, God just throws it away. That's not redemption of the old earth. And so if the Romans passage says uh, it's redemption, it's included in that is redemption of the old earth, then we have to have a renovated earth, not a totally from scratch created new earth. On the other side, you have the uh, issue of the language of destruction. You know, if you go over to 2 Peter 3, You know, it talks about these same things, the new heavens, plural, it uses there, and a new earth in verse 13, 2 Peter 3, 13. But notice the context, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness. And that's the context in which he talks about a new heaven and new earth in that passage. And so you have rather strong language, and people uh, often apply this passage. Some apply it to the first part at the beginning of the millennium, but others see it at the end of the millennium as we go into the new heavens and new earth. So what about that? Now, I lean toward the first view. And one of my responses to the second view on the language of destruction is that there is destruction language used for the flood, for Noah's flood. The earth was destroyed. And, and so I don't mind destruction language here. It doesn't mean the earth is annihilated. It means that all the things that are there are gone, purified by fire. One day God destroyed the world with water, and he's coming one day destroy it with fire. I lean toward the first view because I, I struggle with the idea that the, the old earth is never to be redeemed. Now, probably the one that I get the most questions on, which is probably the least important, is no more sea. See that in verse 1? Also, there was no more sea, and some of you are bummed out. Because some of you, you know, and I hear this all the time, I want my log cabin out by the lake. That's the way I want my eternal destiny to map out. And here it says, no more sea. You got a picture there from Revelation Illustrated of, that's uh, intended to be the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos in chapter 1 of Revelation, looking out at the Mediterranean, or not the Mediterranean, over uh, off of Turkey, near the Mediterranean. Now, a couple of views here. Is this literal? No body of water on the new earth? And then what about rivers? We know coming out of the city, there is a river. We showed a picture of a river before, so 
in our minds, the way things are today, with the rivers, they're usually bodies of water. And so we struggle in visualizing how that might work. And so it's possible that it's symbolic. Now, let's look at a couple passages. You know, and I went through and I studied every word. Actually, I, I did a search in my Logos Bible software of every single time the Bible uses the word sea, S-E-A. And in the book of Revelation, I especially focused on that word and what it says. And many times in the book of Revelation, it's very literal. You know, this, this was dumped into the sea, and a third of the fish died. You know, it's very literal to see there. Uh, but then there are other passages, and I list a couple of them here uh, for you. Revelation 4, 6. In the throne room of heaven, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. Well, that's not a literal water sea. Okay. So you have a passage like that in the book of Revelation. Then in 15.2, the introductory chapter to the bold judgments. In 15.2, he sees seven angels having the seven last plagues in verse 1. But then in verse 2, I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. I think symbolic imagery of judgment coming from the throne of God. And so there are some times in the book of Revelation where the word sea is symbolic. But then, um, in the Old Testament, we see that as well. In uh, something different than a literal. In Daniel 7, which is one of the most important chapters in the Bible. Daniel 7, verse 2 and 3. Daniel, there's this dream, visions, and he has the vision of the four world empires. Remember that? In the form of animals. You know, in chapter 2, it's a statue. In chapter 7, it's these animals. The last one, kind of an iron animal. And, and they're strange animals. Uh, but he says, in verse 2, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And you think of that as maybe the Mediterranean from his perspective. But then when you think about it, this four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. And when you think, okay, what are they? They're Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now, only two of those are off the Mediterranean. Babylon is not off the Mediterranean. Okay. Neither is Persia. So great sea there may not refer to the Mediterranean Ocean. So it could refer in a symbolic way to the, the great sea of nations. And that's interesting. When you come to Revelation 13, verse 1, that's the Antichrist chapter in Revelation then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns, ten crowns, and on his heads, a blasphemous name. Uh, and it's interesting, later on, he talks about the earth. And so I tend to think that the sea here is symbolic. And in Revelation chapter 20, you have the last gasp against God. Remember, Satan gets let out. And he leads the nations, the sea of nations. It doesn't use the word there, though. Sea of nations against God, and God destroys them once and for all, forever. And so the reference here might refer to that. No more sea, no more sea of nations in revolt against God. That's a possibility for this. And if I'm right about that, you can have your log cabin out by the lake. Now, the next thing in the passage in verse 2 is the new Jerusalem, but that's Jim's message in the next uh, hour. So I'll leave that for him. In verse 3, we have the full presence of the triune God. Notice how in 21, verse 3, it says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. 
And what's interesting is in the millennium, which is before this, Jesus is on the throne in Jerusalem. God the Father is where? Still in heaven. In the eternal state, God is moving his address to the new earth. And the fullness of the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, the fullness of that, unlike anything experienced before, will be there. Now, we know that God is omnipresent. God is everywhere all the time. That's what the Bible says, Psalm 139, other passages. And it's not that part of him is in Mississippi and the other part is in Richmond. All of God is everywhere all the time. I mean, God can project himself like that. You and I can't do that. He's an infinite being. So he is everywhere all the time. But you know, he chooses to localize. This is the way I say it. He chooses to localize his presence. And his abode, the abode of God, the third heaven, that's wherever he chooses it to be his abode, his localized presence. He also has localized his presence in many ways throughout Scripture. He localized his presence in a burning bush. He localized his presence in a pillar of fire and a cloud, in the Shekinah glory, in the temple and the tabernacle, in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, in believers in the New Testament age, the church age. We are the temple, right? And he dwells in us. He has localized his presence in us in a special way. Yeah, he's omnipresent all the time, but he's got these things he does localizing his presence. And here he reminds us in the new heaven, the new earth, God, the fullness of God, unlike anything we've experienced and all those expressions is coming to be ours. We might be surprised what we find. Now we come to my favorite verse. So don't blow it here. Verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. No more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain for the former things have passed away. In verse 4 it's stated negatively it's the elimination of the curse. These things tell us there's the elimination of the curse. Death is gone. Death is the obscene great enemy. It's gone. And there's a few things we're going to talk about here in just a minute that are not in that world that we experience today. And verse 5 states it positively. God's making all things new. Well, let's think about what are some of the things that aren't in that coming time that are part of our experience now. I made a list, 40 things. You ready for my list? I put a few humorous ones in there just to make sure you're awake. No shots at the doctor's office. I didn't mean for you to laugh at the first one. No more doctors, no hospitals, no dentists, no root canals, no funeral parlors, no funeral sermons, no funeral directories, no surgery, no bad reports from checkups, no bald head, no teeth that slip, no walking with a limp, no wheelchairs, no high blood pressure, no Dr. Atkins diet, no loneliness, no bitterness and anger, no stupidity, no road rage, no long lines at the airport, no Al-Qaeda terrorists, no car accidents, no telephone calls in the middle of the night, no nursing homes, no rebellious children who bring sorrow to your heart, no abusive parents, no parents who don't understand you. No Democrats. <laughs> now, you, you, you know what the next one on my list is, don't you? No Republicans, no Green Party, no Libertarians, no politicians or lawyers, no political ads on TV, 
No IRS. No serial killers. No wasps. At least with stingers in them. No spinach that tastes like spinach. No dog bites, no snake bites, no sprained ankles, no thorns on the roses. No husbands that walk out on you. No divorce. No marriage, if I understand it right. No broken engagements, no fights with your boss, no pink slips, no bills. No bad relationships that make you cry, no trashy music. No bad TV programs, no bad movies, no bad language, no pornography, no perversion, no temptation, no bad thoughts, no pets that die. No tornadoes, no forest fires, no hurricanes, no jet fighters, no bombs, no missiles, no goodbyes, no tears of sorrow, no death, sorrow, crying, pain. No more broken hearts. That's what verse 4 means. And you could write your own list and we could sit here all day and have 20,000 things. Because God is coming to make all things right. But then uh, we also have another passage in the eternal state in Isaiah. So if you go over to Isaiah chapter 65... Near the end of Isaiah, we have a, a difficult section. We have a difficult section. And I'll explain why that's difficult here in uh, just a minute. And uh, what we have uh, first is that you have new heavens and new earth as an expression used in two verses in Isaiah 65 and 66. In uh, 65, 17, he says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Very similar to Revelation 21, 4. And there'll be rejoicing for every, or evermore, uh, etc. And he mentions Jerusalem, although he doesn't use New Jerusalem as reference there. And then in verse 22 of chapter 66, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will uh, make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And of course, I think he's talking about the Jewish people. Now, here's the, here's the sticky wicket. You understand the sticky wicket? That's a okay, southern expression. You're, you're southerners, most of you. You have death in the kingdom. This is the picture of the kingdom. And you have death in the kingdom. Isaiah 65, verse 20. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner being 100 years old shall be accursed. So it's, it's talking about various things in the kingdom, and he uses the expression new heavens and new earth, and there's kids die. Now how do we put that together? And then there's another one. There are children born in the kingdom. Isaiah 65, verse 20, right next to that. You know, uh, you, since you have infants, you have people being born. What Jesus said in Matthew twenty-two thirty, 30, that there's not going to be any propagation. So how does that all fit together? And I think the best way to look at that is this. It's not a discrepancy in the Bible. It's not a contradiction in the Bible. It is a telescopic view of the peaks of prophecy from an Old Testament perspective. In fact, the Old Testament predicts a forever kingdom. It doesn't know anything about Revelation 20's 1,000 years. See, if you tell me the coming kingdom's 1,000 years, then I take you over to Daniel 7 where it says it's forever. And if you tell me the kingdom is, if I ask that question, you say it's forever, I take you over to Revelation 20 and say, what's this 1,000-year stuff? 
see, we have to put that together well, and I think sometimes our charts don't do that. But what happened is Isaiah looked down the corridor of time, and he saw things in God's forever kingdom. He's just kind of looking down there, and he sees all these things, kind of like a grab bag of stuff that he sees, but he doesn't make any distinctions between the millennium and the eternal state. He's just listing stuff he sees down the road. That's, and it's pretty simple that way. And we come along and we find out from John about this thousand-year millennium where there still is uh, people having kids. And there still is death. The thousand years is not the fulfillment of all the promises. It's the beginning of the fulfillment of all the promises. You with me? God's kingdom is forever and a thousand years cannot fulfill a forever promise. So what I like to do is call the millennium the kickoff party. It's a celebration. And so I, I tend to think that's the way we put this together. Now, there are some questions to consider that I have on the second page of your notes. See, and I, I put, uh, see, I used to be a seminary professor for 22 years. Still teach adjunct every now and then at a school. And so you can kind of tell that. With fill in the blanks, I'm trying to keep you awake. So I have three questions. The first question is this. If the eternal state was God's end game, why didn't he create it to begin with? People ask that. I'm going to suggest this as a possible answer. If God had not allowed the fall, and by the way, in his choice of, of how to do things back there in the beginning, God could have uh, had three options. He had three options. He could have decided not to create. Or if he did create, not create humans. Now, would any of us vote for that option? I don't think we would, okay? He also could have decided to create uh, Adam and Eve as robots. You know, like push a button, they just automatically do what, 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 and so there wouldn't be any free will. But he decided, the third option, to give them a choice. And unfortunately for us, they used the choice in a bad way. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to talk to Adam, and make a beeline to Adam and say, why'd you do it? We have some hints there. He, he may say, I just had a bad day. I don't know. So if God had not allowed the fall, there are some things we would not know about fully. Think with me on this. The idea of redemption. We would never know that concept at all if God had not, not allowed the fall. Related to that is love. Love flowing out of a free will. Never would have known that concept of love. We maybe have known some of it because love existed in the Trinity before the fall, but from a human perspective, we never would have known it fully. Mercy. Withholding due judgment, we would never have known the concept of mercy. Grace, giving us what we don't deserve, piling on more than we deserve. We would not have known that fully. Then goodness, the goodness of God. We would never come to a place where we fully could grasp the goodness of God. Maybe we won't fully get those things now. But there's just this, we'd be way, way behind if God had not allowed the fall. And the God who knows the end from the beginning, he knows how best to do it. Norman Geisler, one of my uh, professors when I was at Dallas Seminary, made this statement. I'm paraphrasing. He said, this world is not the best possible world, but it is the best possible world to get us to the best possible world. And I think there's some truth in the way that that is worded. Okay, so if God, had, if, if the eternal state was 
is God's end game. Why didn't he create it to begin with? Because he wanted some other things, some other things for us to know. Second question. How do we understand the eternal state in terms of the dispensations? I don't know about you, but I've seen all kinds of charts in my 40 plus years of ministry. I've seen three dispensations, four dispensations, five, seven. That's probably the more popular one. I've seen eight. I've seen nine. I've seen 12. People chopping things up and laying it out there. How do we understand the eternal state? And the, the major ways that that's been done, and I have three of them here in, in the, the notes. First one is, is the eternal state, and I word it as a question, is the eternal state a separate dispensation from the millennium in light of the distinctions between the millennium and the eternal state? And there's no question we've already raised some of the differences. So if you look at a chart, and you have, I'm, I'm pointing up here on this one, you have the church age. I, I tend to think there's a gap between the rapture and the trib, but... That's hard to put on a chart like this. So, but then the trib and then the millennial kingdom, the thousand years exactly, there's some discontinuity. There's some things back and forth here that don't match up with the eternal state. You know, we already talked about death and infants being born. That's not going to happen back here. Here, Jesus is on the throne, God the Father still in heaven, here the fullness of the triune God. So there are differences, and we could talk about more of those, but we don't have uh, time to do that. And so uh, one, one understanding is that it's a separate dispensation. So the millennium would be a dis its dispensation, but this would be its own dispensation. That's the way a lot of people view that. And a lot of people who do that will say, we have eight dispensations altogether. Uh, there's some problems with that. And I highlight this particular one. You have the Old Testament promises, and I could add some New Testament ones, but this particular chart has Old Testament ones about the coming kingdom. And remember what I said? The coming kingdom is how long? Forever. The coming kingdom. I, I didn't word it millennium. Coming kingdom. God's kingdom is forever. And so how does that work? This seems inadequate. This seems inadequate to fulfill. Remember, a thousand years doesn't fulfill a forever promise. So uh, maybe we need to do that a little differently. So the second view I express here as a question, is the eternal state part of the overall kingdom dispensation? And it would look like this. You have the promises of the forever kingdom that the prophets talked about. God's coming kingdom, this is the kingdom dispensation that never ends. It has a kickoff party of a thousand years followed by the eternal state. Yeah, there are distinctions here, but it is viewed as the, by the prophets in the Old Testament as one thing with subpoints in it. And so perhaps this is a better way to view things. A third view is that the eternal, and I word it as a question, is the eternal state not part of any dispensational scheme as part of the period when time shall be no more? And so here, got basically the same diagram I had earlier, but instead of these being two separate dispensations, this is the end of earth's history, the eternal state's something else altogether, and so the dispensations just deal with stuff back here, and going forward, there are no dispensations. Uh, that, uh, how would the Old Testament prophets view it? That's the question. How do they view it? And I've already told you, if you look at these passages, and I list a few there for you, if you want to write some of them down. Amos 9, the end of that, is there'll be coming a day when Israel will be in the land never to be taken out again, Ever. Isaiah 9, 6, 7, you know, child is born, that passage. And uh, the, of the, of the, there'll be no end to the government of the Messiah. Daniel 24, God's kingdom forever. Daniel 7, uh, and I, I want to look at that again. Remember I told you this is one of the most important passages in the whole Bible, and I really think it is. In Daniel 7, 13 and 14, 
I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. It doesn't say his dominion is a thousand years, does it? Do you remember the Hallelujah Chorus in Handel's Messiah? And we shall reign for a thousand years. <laughs> oh, what is it? It's forever and ever. Okay? But then come on down to verse 18. Some scholars, unfortunately, will say, hey, well, that Hebrew word olam there, sometimes it doesn't mean forever, forever. Look at verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. That is, the, in Hebrew, the strongest expression to say this ain't going to end. It's going to go on and on and on with no ending at all. And even later in the passage, you have that. So those verses are there for you to write down and go study uh, when you have a chance to do that. And so I come back in light of that. I choose option two. This is how I view it. The eternal state is part of the kingdom dispensation. That's the way that I draw it up. And it makes the most sense. It helps me to keep the prophet's message clear in my mind and understand it also helps me to frame John's thousand years as the kickoff party with some distinctions between that and the eternal state that follows. Now, we always have to have a so what question, right? Uh, you didn't come here today, did you, to just simply learn more data? Did you come today because you wanted to be a better Christian? Those are not the same questions. So, how should you think and live in light of the eternal state, in light of the things we've just discussed? I'm glad you asked. I want you to go to Revelation 22, the last verses of the Bible. I'm going to start in verse 17. And right after this discussion of the eternal state, in 21 and 20, most of 22, I believe it's John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and Jesus giving him the vision, puts an epilogue on here. And in verse 17, he gives the first points of his epilogue. I call this the last of the last things. The first thing he gives, there's a last invitation. It says, the spirit and the bride, and I take the bride here as the church. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. And there's the gospel. Salvation is by grace through faith. It's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You can never do enough good deeds to buy one splinter of the cross that Jesus died on. But here, he says the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who's pricking hearts, and the church, the bride, say come. The church is supposed to be an inviter. The church is supposed to point people to Christ and invite them to make their lives right through Christ. And the message is don't be like me because I'm better than you. It's be like me because God has forgiven me by his great grace. And I'm no better than you. And what, what he's done for for me, he'll do for you. So there is an invitation. So part of your response to all this is, hey, there need to be people that need to be with me there. The second thing uh, is uh, the last warning. I find this very interesting, the last one. 
Verse 18, for I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. That's bad. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. If anybody attacks God's word here in this book, and I think by application anywhere in the book, it proves they're not saved. That may be one of the implications of this. And it's a warning. And it reminds us, why do we even want to study Revelation 21 and 22? Because it is God's word. It is a message to us from heaven. And he puts a warning here to remind us of how important the word of God is. Okay. And the third is the last promise. Verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, the last words of Jesus in the Bible to us, surely I am coming quickly. Now the word quickly in God time is different than our time. But the promise is sure, it is certain, Jesus is coming. He said in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. And he told them, one of the first reasons is I'm coming back once I leave. So it is one of the greatest promises ever for the church and for any person in history because when Jesus comes, he begins to make all things right. Do you believe he's coming? All I need to believe that is that he said so. And that ends the discussion with me. And then the fourth thing that we see is the last prayer. Verse 20, amen, even so come Lord Jesus. So what's the last prayer in the Bible? Come back, Jesus. Let's do it now. Let's hit the fast forward button. Let's go. It's okay. God does not mind if you pray that way. And he doesn't mind if you're disappointed it didn't happen today. Look for tomorrow. Surely I come. Even so, come Lord Jesus. May that prayer, it's a biblical prayer. It's okay for us to pray for the Lord to come back. And then the last thing is the last word of hope. Notice in verse 21, for grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The last word of hope, the word is grace. And it's the grace of Jesus. Remember, grace is God doing for us what we can't do for ourselves. And in salvation, that's him saving us, dying on the cross. And that's something we can't do. And satisfying the wrath of God upon sin in our place. And if we just simply trust him, he takes his perfect record, puts it on our account. There is no greater deal in history. There's also the grace of Christian living. First Corinthians 15, Paul said, it wasn't I that did it. It was God's grace in me that did it. What's he talking about? He's talking about the empowerment of God in his life, in his walk as a Christian. And I don't know what he has in mind here. The invitation is for those who are lost. Maybe this is geared that way too. But for the Christian, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. These seven churches were the ones that received the original copy of this. So he's writing to Christians mostly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. May God's grace govern your lives. And you and I need to live in light of God's grace. Understanding, without him, we can do nothing. Let's make that, these last things, the last things of the last things, our response to the greatness of God in these chapters.